and branded content team. Um, so we definitely don't pitch ourselves as a studio. Previously, I was at The Atlantic, and we definitely had the identity of a studio. So I would say just in terms of our overall identity, it's a little bit different than other um, publishers. So we are structured with about 20 um, full-time employees. That's across design, dev, pre-sales, post-sales that are dedicated to all of our branded content and custom content work. Um, and then there are additional synergies within the organization. We can tap into our editorial video team to create branded content, our email team. And then we have preferred partners, specifically with design and dev, that help us um, pull those levers when there is a lot of influx of work. So that's the overall structure of our team. Great. And then we'll pass it along to Michelle. Michelle, your model is a little different. Your site is e-commerce e in nature, in a way. Well, it's, we, what we do is um, she finds helps busy women find things to buy online. Our, our, our data people tell us our audience is uh, women who want fancy things cheap. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we're going for. Um, but we are small. I, this is my company. I started it 14 years ago. And we've gotten here by, and stayed here by being scrappy. So we have you know 10 full-time people. Two are dedicated to both selling and executing. And so we staff up with freelancers when we need be. So for example, last year, eBay um, hired us to do about 600 white labeled shopping guides, um, which was great, but I had to bring in you know, a bunch of freelancers to execute on that um, because the next year they decided they weren't gonna do that again. <laughs> so it's very much like we will, if someone wants us to do something, we will figure out how to get it done. Um, but sometimes it can be a little stressful. Great, Sam? Um, yeah, Sam from outside. Um, we are a smaller, independently owned brand, and so we operate uh, our branded content out of the marketing department, and so it's basically me and one other person, and then we lean heavily uh, on the editors for ideas, other people in the company. We have a quasi-in-house video team that only makes sense for larger budget <coughs> pro uh, projects because they're really expensive. Um, and otherwise, we, we staff up as necessary. I, have, I used to be an editor, so I have a bunch of network of uh, editors, freelancers um, in you know, every uh, platform. So we just scale up or down accordingly as well. Great, and John, let's so, round it out. Uh, yeah, probably a little different bringing a, a B2B angle to the panel, but um, <clears throat> a little quite fortunate in that we are a global news agency. And uh, accordingly, we produce a lot of video content uh, just as a normal part of our day-to-day -day practice of covering the world's events. We also have eight, H, you know, eight uh, high, high HD studios around the world, uh, which uh, certainly help from a production standpoint. Um, and in other regions, we actually white label broadcast solutions. So we have a team that focuses on that as well for, for other markets, particularly in the uh, European and Asian markets. So uh, we have quite a big staff for that reason, you know, certainly north of, uh, north of 50 or 60, not including the sales efforts. Great, and um, just to give some perspective from my seat here at the New York Post, um, we do have Post Studios in-house, and we're a team of about 14 people. Um, we typically produce text branded content, um, going back to what Charlie was saying yesterday with Slate, with text and audio. We do have text and video. Um, we are not doing podcasts right now, but um, we definitely have a talented and diverse team at Post Studios. Most of them um, come from marketing, creative backgrounds, but we do have a few folks that did work on that agency side, so they bring that DNA into um, our in-house studio. So it's worked really well for us. And um, they actually also serve as our marketing team. So they do have that duality of um, building out our marketing materials as well as executing on these custom branded content buys for clients. So moving over, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but um, being, having work done in-house versus outsourcing, like how do you make that call? It sounds like, I mean, for us, I know we pretty much pride ourselves on bringing everything in-house and keeping it there because we want the authenticity of our voice. So um, does it impact how you define branded content when you're outsourcing versus using your inside talent? Would you like me to start? Sure. Anyone that wants to jump in? <laughs> Yeah, so we're definitely product first. So anything that we outsource, we've come up with requirements and a clear, um, we have these product playbook guides to define exactly how the product will be executed. So anything that's being designed or built externally, they have very clear gu guidelines in terms of how the brand will be integrated and it always has the final pass from our in-house team. The truth is most of what is outsourced is um, just custom rich media. So something that is more brand forward, so to speak, than having that integration. Um, something that is really, truly traditional branded content is usually done in-house. And again, it comes down to how big is the deal size, um, what's the priority, what are the, the key KPIs. Um, but in general, we've come up with a structure that works really well for our business. Same, I think, you know, if we outsource, usually to outsource 
freelancers that we use repeatedly or sometimes have actually worked for the company um, before, so they get it, and they have a relationship with the full-time people, and everything goes through the full-time people at the end. But if we can not spend the money to outsource, of course, we hack it together ourselves and keep more money. So <laughs> there's that. Uh, we have to outsource everything, and I, generally speaking, I try to hide information from the, from the brands and the, and the agencies about who's doing it and uh, how much I'm paying for it, unless it's video, because everyone wants to weigh in on video for some reason, and then, you know, I have, the, you know, the brands or the agencies saying, oh, we really like that video crew, but we don't like that video crew, and it just um, causes problems. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll echo Jackie a little bit. We, we primarily focus on quality, right? So whatever is going to give us the best quality of content to provide to our clients is really where we're going to go. We play a lot in, in the financial space, uh, obviously, and uh, so we have a lot of financial clients, and we have a, a real core competency around building that type of content internally and in-house, so in that realm, a lot, almost all of it is in-house versus, uh, versus outsourced, but it's a healthy mix, and really focusing on, uh, on the quality of the output is what's most important. Absolutely, I, I agree. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, so we create this great content for our clients. Let's talk about distribution a little bit. So what is your distribution strategy? Um, do you allow these brands to own the content and distribute it on their O&O? &O? Um, just talk to me a little bit about how, um, you know, who owns that content once it's created? Do you share the rights with your advertisers? Yeah. Um, so for us, usually it's co-owned. It kind of depends on the content. So we think of kind of the content in two ways. There's the content itself. So let's say we create um, a branded content video series. And I have to say, this is a little bit of a different shift. I spent seven years in television where I was at Turner and Discovery and we would fully own any branded vignettes. So this was definitely a shift. And I think it's um, a value that publishing could add, like offer to advertisers that traditional um, linear and just linear companies don't do. Um, so if we do create something, we usually have it set up that we own it and they also own it. Um, when it comes to actually keeping the product itself, so that's the content, but the, the product is kind of the page on which it lives. So if we have a refresh, there's gonna be an additional cost of refreshing that destination, so that is not something we guarantee. So while they might own the content, we do not promise that forever we're going to upkeep, let's say, the landing page, so that is a little bit of a shift. So in terms of who owns it, that's usually our approach is it's co-owned. Um, when it comes to the distribution, it depends on the specific execution. Um, for instance, we just did a branded content video series for Lowe's, and we were hitting a certain amount of video views and that ran across our site. We actually delivered on it early. It outperformed our editorial video. Um, it did really well. So that's how we distributed that versus if it's like a branded content destination, we have different levers in place like Native Inline. Um, we don't tap into social as much as other publishers just because we do have crazy scale. We have about 80 million uniques across all of our um, verticals. So in general, that's our strategy. And just curious, why do you think that Lowe's video performed so well? Do you attribute it to the quality of the content? Was it the topic of the content? Um, yeah, so good question. We're going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole. So. How we create our branded content is really based on our internal first party data and insights and we share that with our brands and then it helps inform the custom content we create. So the Spruce site is our home and food site. It was formerly about home and about food if you're familiar with the oldabout.com. Um, and we have 20 years of data because we have been around since 1997 and we really kind of data mine those insights to understand our audience better and then we could use those to inform our branded content as well. So in terms of the videos we created, we could see that people are very interested in renovations around the kitchen and learning more about how to optimize your kitchen space as opposed to any other area in the home. We could also see that the flight should be in the summer versus the winter. So taking a lot of those insights and even taking insights from our video team um, in terms of learnings about, let's say, having text on the video or when to, like how long a video should be, we take all of those learnings and we apply it to our branded content. So I think the reason it works so well is A, the actual content itself was informed by insights around our audience, and then our distribution strategy, we didn't just run it across the entire network, we only matched it to pages that were relevant to kitchen renovations. Um, which countertop should you have, for instance? Um, and I think that's ultimately why it was. It was the targeting strategy and then also the data that informed the content creation. And that makes we, sense. Yeah, we're a finalist yeah. in the Synopsys D awards for that. So that's oh, really congratulations. exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're very fortunate to have the scale to be able to do something like that. So that's definitely a plus. Um, Michelle, do you have some notes on distribution Yeah, we've strategy? been getting a lot of D to C brands. Mm -hmm. You know, the... Uh, um, 
the, the Everlanes of the world kind of thing, um, who want us to create content that will lend authenticity to their own social media posts. So they distribute it then. So we create it and they distribute it. We had a huge success with a company called Beta Brand, um, which like kind of went, the, it was about, we did a whole bunch of things about pe women, different sizes of women in the, sh in the pants. It's a fancy yoga pant. <laughs> and, like, and people like just loved it and there was like lots of good comments and they were thrilled. So that's always great. Um, the other thing we do is we license. So if we do, we have a lot of um, awards and people want to put the seal on their site. So we license that seal and that's another revenue stream for us. Yeah, I mean, not surprisingly, as a small uh, brand, we have a huge issue with distribution. Um, it's probably one of our greatest challenges with, with branded content uh, at our company is we can create really high quality content um, that performs really well from an engagement standpoint, but we have a really hard time uh, getting the necessary uh, impressions um, and readers to the site or viewers to the video. So uh, I'm uh, always looking for new solutions to help me with that because um, that's our biggest, our biggest challenge. Yeah, so a little, uh, a little different. We take a pretty firm stance on the, uh, on the ownership standpoint and that uh, because we are creating and, and, um, the content on behalf of the client, we do own it. We just own the uh, content, but included with every deal is, uh, is the licensing component for them to use it. So it's just an important distinction for us is that we, uh, we make sure that's clear. It's sometimes confusing for some of our agency partners that, um, like, what do you mean we don't own it? I'm like, well, you can do really whatever you want with it, but you don't own it. So um, it's the same thing, but not really. Um, on, the, uh, on the distribution side, um, we obviously uh, can uh, spread across our, our native placements and on, on our owned and operated. You know, we also are fortunate on our news agency side of the business where we do have you know, literally thousands of publishers around the world that take our content that we produce on a daily basis. We can push it out through that stream and we don't guarantee any pickups by publishers around the world, but if the content is relevant, uh, relevant enough to their audience, they certainly will. So there is uh, some advantages there where we can do that. Got it. So let's talk about scaling the business for a bit. So I think this differs a lot for all of us as we represent different types of content. It's a challenge that we have with um, you know, being in news. I mean, we do have a lifestyle component to our content as well. But um, scaling the business, um, you know, what, is it truly scalable? Is it something that you've been able to, I know, Michelle, you gave the example of, of eBay not renewing. And so, I mean, I'm sure we've all come across that. Like, have you had success in finding that secret sauce to maintaining the business and growing it and scaling it year over year? Or have you not? You know, to talk about successes and failures because we all learn from failures as well. So whoever wants to go first, I don't know if we have to go in order. Come on, guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. I'm, Keep I'm, making Jacqueline go first. We could switch sides. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, for us, is it scalable? So we've been, we've been creating custom content for quite some time uh, ahead of the uh, launch of Reuters Plus formally into the market a, a couple of years ago. And you know, we've, we've seen a great amount of success in terms of retention, but most of it is around quality of the content, to be honest. And that's why we focus so much on it, is that when you understand KPIs up front and, and you understand what success looks like from, from the client standpoint, specifically the client standpoint versus agency, um, then retention is quite high, other than a strategy change, right? Which is not really the same thing that we can say about our traditional media businesses and those streams, is that they can change up quarter to quarter, you know, half to half. Uh, strategies change. So f as far as retention, um, where we've done a good job delivering based on KPIs, we have a very high retention rate. Where we haven't, we don't. And it uh, shouldn't really surprise anyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, our ability to scale is limited by our properties, right? I mean, if you go to outsideonline.com uh, right now, we've probably got 10 native pieces live on our website, and they're all over it. They're on the home page, they're pegged to the, you know, a bunch of different channels, yeah. and, um, you know, they're, we're promoting them in our Facebook feed um, once or twice a day. And so for us, it's trying to figure out that balance. Is that too much for our readers? Is that turning them off? Um, and it, it does come back to, to quality. And so the, you know, our big selling point is that you know, uh, we have literary heritage. That's what we're, the brand has been founded on. That's the way we roll. Our branded content is editorial grade. And as long as I feel like we can keep, keep that up, we're not alienating our readers, but it's always a fine balance. Uh, especially when we, we work with brands outside of our endemic space who want to have more product forward or, or you know, more um, uh, salesy uh, type, type native content, which we know doesn't do well um, on our properties, but um, sometimes they convince us otherwise. Uh, we have a fairly large email newsletter that we use to um to promote you know, the custom content. But I will say it's hard because the like, KPIs keep getting harder. 
Um, you know, they want something super, super creative, but they want it to convert. And sometimes that's not the same thing. So I'm thinking too, like there's a shoe brand who wanted us to do this long quiz, you know, which shoe are you kind of thing. And then it doesn't really sell shoes immediately. So, I mean, maybe it makes you think about, maybe I'll get a boot, you know, in a couple of weeks when I go to the store, but then you're getting tracked on did the conversion happen and then there's complaining. So it's like, it's kind of, it, it's a very kind of touchy dance sometimes. Yeah, when the when the ask doesn't match the KPIs, right? And, and when, do you when push the ask, back? Right, well, yeah. you try, but right. <laughs> how far right. can you get? We were just I only asked because we were kind of sidebarring earlier, and uh, you know there are times where we walk away from deals because the 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 ask is just not realistic with uh, the way the create the content direction is going, and if we know it's going to perform poorly, like it's not going to really benefit anybody. It's not often, but we do. Um, which is kind of scary to say, but we do. Yeah, I think the harder thing is even when the, the goalposts change after you've signed the deal. And so we did a, uh, a brand of content thing with a big beer brand, and they basically, we had this really cool long-form narrative piece, and they said, it's really great, but we want more, more beer in it. That's too light a touch. And so they made us tack on a 20-second, uh, basically pre-roll on top of it, and it's crushing its performance. I mean, absolutely crushing it, right? And so now we're on the hook to deliver a certain number of impressions, and so our profit margins just went to, you know, almost nothing. Right. Um, yeah, I definitely think that there's a challenge when it comes to advertisers wanting bespoke products or never before done, you know, ideas or execution, VR, and it's all these things that are very costly and they have really big upfront, you know, fixed costs the first time you do these things. Um, so what we've kind of, how we've been approaching scaling the business is that we can't be everything to everyone. We are not really thought leaders the way other studios are in terms of t the types of content they have. Um, our bread and butter really is in the evergreen content. We help people learn how to adult. How do you apply for that mortgage? How do I find the best router? What is a smart home? How to cook a quick dinner recipe? So that's kind of the long tail of our content and figuring out how to use the insights and how to tap into the content we have and package it up in ways that are scalable. So we've really focused in on how many products we're offering and then also making sure that everything we pitch, it ties back to content that exists. So we might write new editorial pieces for them or there might be some sort of um, custom design, but 80% of the products need to be something that we're already good at and we already have the infrastructure for. Um, we're really growing out our ad CMS to make sure that we could do things at scale quickly because that's another thing clients ask for is shorter timelines. I want this never before done thing in three weeks. Um, and it has to hit these crazy KPIs. Um, so just saying, you know, we would love to help you, but we're not experts in that area. We recommend this. It has been working for us recently. So you stole my thunder a bit. Uh, we scratched the surface. Just talking about KPIs. What what are the best KPIs for branded content? You know, how should we be measuring success against these programs? I mean, granted, clients will bring us how they want to measure success, but it sounds like we don't always agree with how they're measuring success because branded content may not necessarily convert immediately. And so, so what have your experiences been? What do you think the best metric really is in this in this arena? Want to start? It doesn't really Big matter question. what I think. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter what I think because what I'm, you know, if they want, it's what they want is what I have to deliver. So we've actually had to drop the prices on some things because in order to make sure they got a positive ROI, like the Gap came to us and is like, every dollar we put in, we want ten dollars back. I'm like, me too. So you know, like, I don't know. You know tell me how that works. I'm in the wrong business. No, but it's um, uh, so I, it, we've actually tried to figure out some less expensive products that we can offer so that we don't have to have such, hit such a high level of return on sales? Um, I think that depending on the type of brand and content, and again, our, our team not does, does brand and content, but we're also doing custom ads, and we just recently acqu acquired Investopedia, so there are some performance products like tools, but like, I don't know, mortgage calculator, for instance. So I think figuring out what their KPIs and making sure you're recommending what they Will, will actually achieve those KPIs, understanding that a lot of times they do come back and say, no, we would actually like X, Y, or Z, which we know is not going to perform. So I think it's that balance of being perhaps willing to lose the business because you know you can't deliver on that, and at the same time trying to do some education along the way. Um, when I was at The Atlantic, there was a lot of education about how branded content really helps with brand awareness, but it is not really a conversion tool. There are different products that are optimized for that. So I do think we're still in this um, period where the marketplace has definitely grown over the past five years in the arena of branded content, but there's still some education to be done around which specific solutions make the most sense for particular KPIs. And I think showing case studies and back success or past success has really helped us to prove our point, but 
customers always right to a certain extent, but you also have to prioritize what makes sense for your business. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because we spent a lot of time on that, that point, you know, where on the RFP it says they want custom content, but then when you see what the KPIs are, they don't align. So we actually, yeah, oftentimes we try to have a conversation with them and, and be like, you know, what, what, what do you really want? I mean, I know you, you, what you, want, you say you want custom content because it's the cool new thing and everyone wants to, you know, content is king, blah, 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 blah. But is that actually really, are you trying, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to sell shoes or are you trying to tell your brand story because you're a new brand and you want to rub up against us because we're cool? Um, hopefully it's the latter. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, again, I think we're just a little bit different in that the categories that we play in for the most part um, and uh, accordingly who we sell content and we create content for play more in the brand, you know, the, the objectives are more brand or storytelling versus uh, moving product. Um, so it, it plays a little bit differently there. But I think we bring up a fundamental question as we're talking about clients, we're talking about agency KPIs, right? And, and um, I think one of the challenges, and we've had a couple examples of this, is that you know, agencies want to transact on custom content the way they do every other type of media deal, which it just doesn't work that way, right? You, you want to create a 12-part video series, and it's going to have production costs, and there's going to be timelines. And we can include a certain number of rounds of editing into it. And beyond that, there's going to be fees, and that's confusing. Um, we can't just take your, your standard I.O. We need a, a, a statement of work that meets, that covers us and all the different costs that we'll take on. So there's, there's different challenges there that, that work. You know, we had one client where we produced some great content for, uh, for them in, uh, in the consultant space. And uh, they needed to, they wanted to transact on a, uh, on a CPV basis, which was fine with us around videos. We, we backed into a CPV around video, the number of video completions that we thought we could get. And a four month, camp, three month campaign, we completed delivery in three weeks. It's like, okay, do you want us to pull the content down? Are you gonna keep paying us the CPV above what you've contracted? This is what you wanted. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. Nice problem to have. <laughs> if they, yeah, but if they, ha they have to commit the dollars to keep going, right? So it's, otherwise we would have given it to them if we had our regular standard sponsorship stuff. But you chose to transact this way, so let's transact. So going back to the theme, are publishers agencies, are we leaving agencies out in a lot of these um, deals? I mean, are you working more with clients directly or are you still working with the agencies? It sounds like it's a little bit of a mix of both. Where have you had more success? Um, at Dot Dash, we're mostly partnering with agencies directly, um, just because a lot of it is custom ad products, custom rich media, more turnkey solutions. I will say at The Atlantic, we did work with clients directly um, because it was more those brand awareness plays. So agencies, I would say like 85% of the time. We're the opposite. I think we're, uh, I mean, we're smaller <laughs> than you, so probably it's the scale thing. But um, almost everything is direct client. When we have had agencies, I will like to, I would like to say that I was complaining about the how quickly they pay. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, so it, it's my preference to work with the brand because the agencies can sit on money for a long time. Which when you're small, the cash flow is not good. Yeah, we're, we're like 50-50 agency brand, and yeah, I prefer to work with the brand uh, in almost all cases. Uh, yeah, I would say 75% or more of our, our custom content deals involve client interaction, involvement, um, and then a majority of those are maybe executed or contracted via the agency, but um, it's pretty critical to have that client involvement for us. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think we see a mix of that as well. Um, so just thinking about, you know, we're creating all this, all this great content, whether it's content or, you know, a tool in the case of, of Jack. Has your branded content studio helped drive innovation in a larger editorial sense for your site as well? Good start. For us, definitely. Um, last year, we actually rolled out a new gift guide product, and it performed really well. We executed it with um, Verizon, Google Stores, and Microsoft, and it's actually helped in Form our, we have a big commerce team that's been growing, so it's actually helped inform their product testing and how we're thinking of rolling out new formats for the site. So I definitely think that in general, um, anything that is done by Dot Dash Creative, we have a little bit more creative flexibility. So in a way, it's a, a creative playground to figure out what works, what doesn't work. We have all the tools of the site to A-B test things. Like, for instance, you were talking about that challenge with having to put pre-roll. We've gotten requests like that from clients, and we've said, no problem, we're going to put it in Proctor Buckets. Let's see how it performs. And then you kind of prove to them that's hurting performance. So I definitely think that for us, being able to do first-to-market custom executions for a client can then inform the innovation on the site as a whole. 
I'd say it's about packaging what we have so that we have a regular thing that we can sell. So we do something called Sample Saturday every Saturday where for beauty companies to be partake in. Um, and on Tuesdays, Treat Yourself Tuesday for retailers with a special offer. So we're trying to do more and more of those so that we can sell them into infinity. Yeah, we, we have to do a lot of innovative stuff because we have a lot of returning customers and they, they really like our native and they want to come back for more. Like we, we did four pieces over the last two years on why you should go to Mammoth Lakes. That was really challenging, right? After the second one, I was like, well, what else do you say about why Mammoth Lakes is yeah. awesome? <laughs> um, you know, and the same thing with Michigan. Uh, last year, just to use a specific example, we wrote a, a really great trail guide for Michigan. It was the best paddling, hiking, and biking trails. And they'd never had that tourism Michigan. And so they liked it so much, they came back to us last year and said, what can we do with trails again? I was like, well, you don't have that many more trails, no offense to Michigan. <laughs> it's just, you know, but, so what we did was we took those things and we shot videos and we updated, we did an interactive map and we blew it out in this really nice flashy um, custom landing page and added the video element and we charged them a lot more money. Um, and now we're rolling out that template to the editors. And so um, it definitely happens that way at, at our company. Yeah, I mean, I would, let's be clear, our editorial strategy is to cover the news of the day on a global basis, right? And be the trusted source for, for other publishers around the world. So I wouldn't say it's informed our, our editorial strategy. What it has done is, is spoken uh, great lengths of how uh, our product team um, uh, integrates the content within our owned and operated platforms and how our users prefer to, uh, prefer to engage with it. So more on the product side than, than edit. Great, and I think, um, do we have time for one more question for the panel? Do you want to open it up? Okay, great. So um, just one more for all of you here before we open it up to the floor, and that is looking ahead, what do you think are the biggest challenges and or opportunities for branded content as we move into 2019? Where do you see the growth? Is it, is it video? Is it podcasting? Um, we've heard a lot of great things about newsletters in the past couple of days here. So what are your thoughts? I think influencer networks. I think different, more innovative, like, ad formats and influencers are inherently very authentic. They're different than celebrities. So I think we're right now working on building an influencer network in-house using our own um, experts and editorial contributors. So I think influencers will be taking off even more in 2019. I think it's attracting the audience that wants to buy things. That's what we're, we're focusing on now is really trying to double down on that because People want conversion. They don't need, you know, and they can go to Facebook for it. They can go to Amazon for it. They can, so, you know, what, what do we have to offer? So we have to offer sexy conversion, I guess, you know? At scale. At scale. <laughs> Less money. I, we, I, we just need new products, new, way to, new ways to tell stories. Um, new, you know, new products. If it's in a newsletter, if it's on social only, you know, I, I got to figure out how to take Native off the site, off social, because I, I have limited resources there. I mean, for us, it's twofold. It's, it's getting uh, in front of more of the right clients, right, and, and making sure that we have the right access there. Um, and then we have to figure out a way to, to contract more easily on, on, on these type of deals um, because that will just allow us to execute quicker. Great, thanks. We have time for questions. Hey, Bill. Hello. Sorry. Uh, Bill from ESPN. Thanks, this is very informative. Um, branded content compared to the rest of what you're selling, what, how big of a business is it like percentage-wise for, for each of your companies? I can start with that one. I can say um, it's definitely a huge area of focus for us. We're definitely seeing that on the digital side, it's mostly programmatic, um, and then direct dollars are funneling into this branded content bucket. So if I had to estimate, um, probably around 20% of our revenue. Yeah, I would guesstimate around 30%, and we are, we have a huge programmatic business, so we are trying to figure out ways to allow PG deals and obviously like, like bigger PMPs to have those types of just turnkey editorial sponsorships, just like putting up their logos on editorial journeys is one of our products. Um, so that's something that I think is gonna expand as we figure out ways to better monetize our programmatic business. I would say 30% as well, so the, our other things are programmatic and um, affiliate commission. Yeah, it's 30% directly to our digital revenue, but it's tied to like almost 50% of the larger digital programs we do. And then where we've had a lot of success is, is like, okay, if you're going to commit to telling a story with us, let's do it across all our platforms. So like last year, you know, we did maybe 25 advertorials, old school, right? But, and sometimes they're the, exactly the same story that ran on the site, but we can 
convince them to run it in print as well, because we only have a 30% overlap. And then we say, well, what the hell, while we're at it, why don't we interview the main character and for a host right spot on our podcast? And so we're able to leverage it across all our platforms. So it's really a bigger part of our revenue than that initial number might indicate. Sure. Uh, we still have a, a healthy slash chunky direct business. So that's still the bulk, of our, uh, the bulk of our revenue on the consumer side of the business. But it hovers anywhere between 25 and 30% on the content marketing side, custom content. Hey, I'm John Lucas from VentureBeat. Just a couple of questions around turnaround time. Assuming no video is involved, how many edits do you typically allow, and what's a reasonable turnaround time to get it live? Six weeks for us, two edits, two rounds of edits. I would say we, we mirror that. It depends on the product. So some products, like a, the gift guide, we could get up in like a week and a half. Um, there are other products that are more custom that might take six to eight weeks. And then custom rich media, we could do, and again, depending on the client feedback, one to three weeks, depending on the, the features that are within the product itself. Usually like, uh, it depends what it is. Like if someone's having a, something in last minute they must promote and they have extra money, we will make it happen, so. Yeah. Then six hours. <laughs> so, right. so, I mean, that, I, you know, you know, I, we, are, we make it happen if it needs to happen. So, um, and the edits, I would like to say too, but it probably goes over. I have a question about the front end and the sales side here about how, about how much the ideation is going on on your side and how much ideas are being brought to you, but also how you're managing uh, the sales piece. How much of this you're selling, when you're selling, how many people are selling it, um, and what part of the mix it is for them? Because that has a lot to do with regulating your flow. Right, and I'm, I'm happy to take that one on first. Um, so yeah, so we have a national sales team, a local sales team, and a luxury sales team. Most of the branded content comes from the national sales team, and I am pretty much partnering with them as their specialist. So I'm helping them bring this to market. In terms of ideation, it's very collaborative. Um, you know, the salespeople know their client very well, and so we tend to have um, a huddle where we talk about the KPIs, we talk about what the brand is looking to do, but then the Post Studios team is in there with us, and they can help bring us the ideas of, um, you know, just thinking about the access we have to certain editors or you know things like that that may help us shine a lens on something that would really perform well for a client. So um, it's just a very collaborative effort in terms of ideation. And in terms of going to market, um, it's definitely a big part of our sale, but we have to make sure that it makes sense. We're not going to force it if it's not organic. Is the ideation, is the, are the brands in the room for the ideation, or is this a oh, um, is this sales? No, is this, sales this is just sales. This is internal. Okay. So you're yeah. bringing the ideas to the The ideation the is internal. However, we are open to ideating with a brand. If they want to be part of the process, it just gets a little sticky sometimes, because we really want to own it. They're coming to us for our expertise in creating something on their behalf. And so while there are rounds of review, as we spoke about, um, you know, we certainly, you know, we're open to it if it has to happen. But for the most part, we don't ideate with the brand. Yeah, I mean, for us, pre-sale, top line ideas will, will come from, from the outside, from client or agency. Um, and then we brainstorm between our studio team, our sales dev team, um, to provide initial, initial output on that. Um, and then post-sale, we do encourage a lot of client interaction. Um, we will have uh, uh, brainstorming sessions to, to get through it, even post-sale, just to make sure that we're hitting on the right, on the right targets and, and uh, um, checking all the right boxes. Yeah, we do a lot of the same things. We spend a lot of our time uh, as the marketing department convincing our sales team not to pitch native custom ideas because it's, it's a crutch, right? And so they get an RFP and they really want to win it. And, um, you know, so the, the, a novel idea they feel like is, gonna, is the best option. And, and in a lot of cases, not only is it not the best option, it doesn't align with their KPIs. Plus, it's a ton of work to execute, both um, on the branded content team and then also the salesperson. Even if we're managing a lot of that content, inevitably the salesperson, you know, depending on the, the deal, is, is very involved too. And that takes away their time to be selling, you know, ideas and media plans to other partners. I mean, it's really important post RFP when you when you get those that are, are conflicting, is to uh, like get on the phone and understand what really matters because pitching a customer component probably wouldn't be the right thing in about 65% of the time, right? And so if your goal is to win RFPs, then the more you know about that, the better. So we're small, so we have you know, just two salespeople, but we get leads from a lot of places. Uh, other websites sometimes will um, partner with us because they, they need more inventory. 
So they will come to us and say, let's do this thing together. And so we don't necessarily have to go after that. Um, and I personally have an agent for, as an influencer. For, and so we get like, he brings things from PR companies, which are sometimes easier to work with because they just want the, um, the eyeballs. They don't really care what else happens after that. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Josh Rubin, Daily Dot. What processes do you have in place to deal with unhappy customers? Are you dealing with make goods? Are you Meditation. Dealing... <laughs> I think it depends on why they're unhappy. Um, do you have like a specific example of like what you have in mind? No, they're not happy with the results of the campaign. How are you, you know? It, it does come back to, to trying to have a clear picture up front of, of what success looks like. And, and again, this is why we have our clients, whether it's agency or client direct, sign a, a, an SOW, that, and it, it outlines that stuff. And really where they're not happy with is you know, where we have to bill for extra rounds of editing or going back to the studio because somebody doesn't like that guy's hair. Like, you know, we, this stuff costs money to go back and we do that. So um, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, we just have to revert to our T's and C's and, and try, to, try to work through it without using things like legal. Um, but uh, uh, it's tough, it, it's a challenge. Yeah, I think managing expectations up front for us, I was actually surprised by how much people are dependent on mocks. Um, we've tried to kind of do prototypes instead, but I think showing clients what something will look like and have the ability to actually like interact with it before any big investment goes into it is huge because then there are no surprises. Um, and we've really been training our post sales team to manage client expectations along the way, even in terms of the turnaround times. Like we don't have very specific windows. We have an overall workflow because we've been adopting an agile methodology. So even communicating to them how it's going to look, we will hit your launch date, but it's not necessarily going to be on this day that you see the first like living stage link. Um, so I think a lot of it is about client management. How are you managing uh, audience extension and buying, buying up audiences externally and what you're telling and working with clients in terms of what their guarantees are for your in-house inventory, differences in effectiveness and brand safety, all those issues that surround extensions? Bueller, Bueller. Yeah. I'd have to say on my end, um, you know, we're pretty large, we have scale, we're about 70 million uniques a month. So typically our deals deliver within our own walls. We don't typically extend outside, I mean, sometimes on social for promotion or things like that, but it's not something that we typically deal with, just due to our size. Is that true for most of you? You're, you're satisfying yeah, for, for your inventory, the most part, your inventory there'll be, there'll be some, uh, uh, some client asks that require, uh, you know, extensive social uh, extension and for, for that, you know, uh, you know, we'll use the likes of social flow, give a, give a plug to somebody on the stage here or on the sponsor list. But, um, uh, but for the most part, it's the same thing. We, we'll cover through owned and operated, but we'll be transparent either way. For the eBay deal, we had to promise X amount of traffic, so we built that in, what we were going to spend, and we, I have a a vendor who runs my ad buys, and you know, ran them through, to get them down to whatever price you can get them to through Facebook or Outbrain or Taboola or whatever we're doing. Tara's gonna be leading the round table on this very topic at the end of the morning. Tara, panel, thanks very much. Thank